and I'm going to use the visuals, which I see on page 290 and 291 in your textbook to help. All right, so this is a picture of the motor end plate. What's that mean? What's that yellow thing up there? It's the axon of a what? Of a motor neuron. Very good. Where that axon meets the, what's this? Muscle cell. We call that a motor unit. So a nerve impulse takes place. We're getting a message from the central nervous system that I need to walk across the stage. In order for that to happen, the following has to happen. I have to get a nerve impulse, which causes the release of a neurotransmitter. In this case, what's the name of the neurotransmitter? Acetylcholine, ACH. The ACH is released from the motor neuron end or axon terminal and comes in contact with receptors on the what? On the what of the muscle cell? What's a sarcolemma? The plasma membrane of a muscle cell. Opens up receptors, and who comes flooding into the cell? Not acetylcholine. Acetylcholine opened the receptors. Sodium. Sodium rushes in, changes the what? Membrane potential. It takes a ride down one of these little T tubules. And increased sodium levels are going to cause calcium channels to open on the terminal cisternae. Calcium's then going to flood, <clears throat> what are these log looking things? What are these? Made up of sarcomeres. Myofibrils. Calcium's going to flood the area, come in contact with troponin. Troponin is going to change shape and pull tropomyosin away from the binding sites on the thin filament or actin molecule, exposing them. Who's going to attach to those binding sites? Myosin, which is in the energized configuration at rest, reaches up, grabs onto those binding sites on the actin molecule, and undergoes a what? What's that called? Power stroke. The ADP phosphorus complex releases, exposing the binding sites for ATP on the myosin head. ATP has to bind to myosin in order for myosin to do what? Let go. And as it goes down, what happens? How? Correct. So ATP is then hydrolyzed into ADP and phosphate. With the help of water, I'm going to break off a what? Phosphate. Now it's going to release energy. That myosin head is going to hold on to that energy. Then what has to happen in order for the whole rest of the cycle to happen? We have to get calcium back into the terminal cisternae so those calcium punks pumps wake back up, push calcium back into the terminal cisternae, getting the charge back to its normal state. <whistles> Troponin goes back to its original configuration, pulls tropomyosin back over those binding sites, and the muscle is again at what? Rest. You should know all of those steps. Where are you going to see them and find them and hear them and see them in writing, your interactive physiology. The sliding filament theory under the muscle category. 
again, the stuff that we looked at last class. So be sure that you know that for the next exam. We good? Okay. So this diagram helps because you see exactly what we just discussed in words. We see the T tubules. We see the little triads. We see the terminal cisternae, which is part of the endoplasmic reticulum system of a muscle cell which contains high concentrations of calcium. When those calcium pumps become paralyzed, very similar to what we see when the sodium pumps become paralyzed, calcium is going to be able to rush out and flood the area coming in contact with troponin, changing the troponin tropomyosin complex and exposing those binding sites on the actin molecules Myosin, who, who is very highly attracted to those binding sites, can now reach up and grab on and bind and pull power stroke. What happens to the sarcomere during the power stroke? It's not Thanksgiving yet, you know. I think, yes, or it, it, it shortens. What disappears? I'm really going to tax your brain. The H zone disappears, yes? Okay. So, during the power stroke, the sarcomere shortens. All those sarcomeres shortening is going to cause what to shorten? The muscle to shorten. So, we see that different motor nerve groups <coughs> can stimulate several different muscle cells within any given fascicular group. The more power I need, the more nerve stimulation I will get. So I've, I've given examples many times about this horrendous book bag, right? Right now there's nothing in it. So when I go to pick it up, it's easy, yes? But when I put all my crap back in it, the same exact movement has to take place, right? But can I have the same amount of nerve impulse to pick it up? No, because what do I need to do? What do I need to do to pick up the bag with all the crap? I have to, I have to contract more muscle cells. Do you see where I'm going with this? So when the load becomes heavier, I have an increase in nervous system stimulation to contract more and more muscle cells, even though it's the same movement, to pick up a heavier load. Okay? In lab in the next few weeks, you're going to see, um, do some histology, and you'll look at that motor unit. What is this? This looks kind of familiar. Some of the terms describing what's going on here look familiar, too. Why do they look familiar? Somebody said it. Looks similar to what? Very good. It looks very similar to the tracing we saw when we looked at a nerve impulse. Nerve impulse. Give me some terms associated with a nerve impulse. Action potential. Threshold. Hyperpolarization. Depolarization. Repolarization. Same thing. And everybody knows why all of that stuff happened in a nerve or neuron, right? Same reason it's happening here in the muscle cell. So we see a chemical change that's going to cause a series of events that's going to cause depolarization and repolarization, a change in what for muscle? In the nerve we were taught, or neuron, we were talking about electrical stimulation, which opened up a whole bunch of voltage-gated channels and then caused something to come out the end. When we talk about depolarization, repolarization in muscles, we're talking about what? 
Yeah, exactly, the shortening and lengthening. Again, it's a change in chemistry. It's a change in what's going on within the cell that causes it to shorten and lengthen. <clears throat> so the players here are a little bit different. We're talking about proteins like troponin and tropomyosin and myosin and actin that are going to cause the change inside a muscle cell. But we have a similar tracing. In this case, we're not looking at charge. What are we looking at when we look at this diagram? So we have an x-axis and we have a y-axis, yes? What's the y-axis? Is it change in charge? Even though there is a change in charge going on. Tension, exactly. Shortening of those sarcomeres. When you think of shortening of the sarcomeres, think of a tug of war. Did you ever play tug of war? Okay, so you got a, a whole bunch of people on either end. Hopefully you get the strong person, right, on your team. Is everybody pulling at the same time? And letting go at the same time? What would happen if that was the case? You, you no, know, you wouldn't break the rope. You, you wouldn't go anywhere, right? So some people are pulling and some people are letting go to get a new grip to pull. Same thing's happening with the troponin and tropomyosin and myosin and actin. So you see all of those little myosin heads coming up, grabbing and power stroking at different times to shorten the sarcomere. So what we see here in the y-axis is the percent of tension that's being built up by all of these little molecules pulling on those sarcomeres. And as that tension builds up, we have contraction. So we see up at the top, latent period. It, it just doesn't happen automatically, does it? it? Takes a little time for everybody to start pulling to start doing what? Yeah, shortening those sarcomeres. So just like we did see with a nerve impulse, it took a little bit of time for the change to start occurring. Again, in this case, the change is tension, pull shorten those sarcomeres. Then we have a rapid tension increase during the period of contraction. And then when calcium gets pumped back and all the chemistry starts to get back to normal, all of those little myosin heads are going to go back into their resting configuration. What's happening as we see that happen to my tension? It goes down. Exactly. So that's the relaxation period. We could call it depolarization and repolarization, repolari just like we called or used those terms when we discussed a nerve impulse. So that myogram is a measure of the change, chemical changes, change in charge, that shows us a change in tension in the muscle. So we can pick that up on a machine, just like we were able to pick it up with an EEG, electroencephalogram, and brain activity, right? So what is this diagram showing us? Some muscles are contracting for long, long periods of time like the muscles it's taking me to stand up here and talk to you, like the muscles it's taking that are, are contracting for me to hold my head up while I'm conscious during the day. And some muscles move really quick and then they're done. So the next part of the book talks about the fact that any given muscle group has a combination of different muscle cells that are there for different purposes. To move the muscle large and quick, but I can't do those for long periods of time, or to keep a constant contraction for muscles that need to help me with posture or to stand. So this diagram is a comparison of the relative duration of twitch responses in three different muscle groups. Where the heck are these muscles? Let's try and figure it out. 
Well, the latent period is similar for all these guys. The twitch is similar for all these guys. But we see that some of them have the ability to go for longer periods of time. Where's the soleus muscle? Anybody know? Yes, they're in your legs. Yeah, in your calf region. And what am I doing right now? Standing for? You see where I'm going with this? Where's the gastrocnemius muscle? Close. That's your homework. Try and find out where these muscles are. There's a whole bunch of muscles in the calf. And but what do you think it does? Well, it helps me to do what? Yeah, or move move quickly. <laughs> yes. Okay. Do you see where I'm going with this? So extraocular muscle. Where the heck is that? That really doesn't do a whole heck of a lot unless I'm doing that. Yeah. So we see that different groups of muscles have different groups of fibers for different purposes. Do I have to move a lot quickly? And typically those guys can only do that for a short period of time. Or do I have to be able to contract muscles to some degree for long periods of time? And that's what the book talks about next. So when we look at different responses in different muscle groups, we see these different fibers doing their different jobs. I can't do certain things for long periods of time without the muscle becoming what? Tired, because those fibers aren't meant to do things for long periods of time. So when I make a movement like this, how long is that going on for? If I keep doing that, what's going to happen eventually? Yeah, it's, it's going to start to cramp up and get tired. Okay? So when we look at these different stimuli being applied, and when I do this repeatedly, I'm applying what? Repeated stimulus to cause these muscles to contract. So we look at some of these different tracings, we see the results with different muscle groups depending on what's going on and what they have to do. They can't, they can't constantly be contracting. And even the muscles that were meant to contract for long periods of time, by the end of the day, what are some of the things you feel when your muscles are just ready for a rest? Especially think about your neck. You've been up for way too long. You haven't gone to sleep. One of the things sleep is going to allow you to do, besides regenerate a whole bunch of chemicals in your body, is allow some of those muscles to do what? Relax. To relax and to rest. So think about your neck, holding your head up all day long. Yeah, your head feels heavy, your neck gets sore, right? So summation and graded responses is the discussion in the textbook of repeated stimulation or repeated muscle contraction. When I have to pick this bag up and the load gets heavier, in order for me to overcome the load, what does my nervous system have to do? Fire more and more stimulus to contract what? more and more muscle fibers. So we see summation take place as well. At some point, I'm going to contract all the muscle fibers in any given muscle. Can I, go, can I create any more tension than that? No. 
If I keep stimulating over and over and over again, remember what happened to the nerve or the neurons when I kept stimulating them over and over again? Well, what happened to them? Think of perfume in the morning. Or becoming less sensitive to a stimulus. That's their protection mechanism. What happens to our muscles? If I can't make enough ATP to cause myosin to release from actin, what's going to happen to my muscles? They're going to stay contracted. That's what we see. Or you get a what? You get a cramp if you're walking for long periods of time. And again, it's not just over-exercise that can cause this to happen. It's anything in your metabolism that causes you not to be able to produce enough ATP to cause the release of your muscles. Or if there's chemicals in your body that are taking up the binding sites for ATP on the myosin head, that can also cause you to cramp up as well. some chemical imbalance. It could be imbalance with calcium. It could be an imbalance with the overproduction of um, energy anaerobically because I'm not getting enough oxygen. So any chemical disturbance that disrupts that chemical cascade of events can cause muscles to cramp. So what we see here is too much frequency is eventually going to cause those muscles to stay contracted. That's called fused or complete tetanus. What is tetanus? It's kind of the same term here. Why do you get a tetanus shot? Because there's a lovely little organism that lives in the dirt all over the place that gives off a toxin when it gets into your bloodstream that can cause your muscles to do that because the toxin takes up that binding site I was talking about. Now, it's not just in your jaw that the problem is. It's in your muscles systemically, like muscles like your diaphragm. So if you're not able to contract and relax your diaphragm, you're not able to do what? Breathe. So that can be a problem. So that shot is helping you make antibodies against the organism so it won't build up in your system and build up the toxins that it gives off. That's what a tetanus shot is. So when we look at any given muscle group then, we see different proportions of muscle being excited depending on the load that we have to lift or the stimulus that we're getting from the nervous system. So if we look at the little circles down here at the bottom, we see the proportions of motor units that are going to be excited and the result from that. The more of those little dots we fill in, the more muscle cells or muscle fibers we're going to stimulate and the more tension we can create in any given muscle group. So the bigger the load, and you know what we're talking here? Did you know we, that you were learning physics right now? Now, physics is an extremely dirty word in my book. I don't know about you guys, but you're learning it right now. So that shows us the proportion of motor units that are excited and the load that we're able to lift. I can't lift anything heavier than a muscle can pull with all of its cells contracted. Does that make sense? It's physically impossible. Anybody have any questions? What, what are you getting more of? More myofibrils, right? Muscle fibers are muscle cells. You're getting more myofibrils within the muscle group. So that circle becomes what? Bigger. More myofibrils, you can apply more. Talk physics. Tension. More tension, I can lift more 
load. So that, that's what happens when you get stronger. Everybody with me? So they also talk about, and there's a lot of repetitive stuff in here, and the terms all kind of mean the same thing. But um, they talk about different recruitments, different motor units firing off for different periods of time, depending on the load that has to be lifted. The more motor units that fire off, the more tension that can be applied, the more load I can lift. So as we see the recruitment of different motor units, we see more tension being able to be applied to the muscle and a heavier load to be lifted. So that's kind of repeat information of that. So on page 297 in your textbook, we see different types of contraction. When a muscle is working, let's call it working and not contraction, because when we think contraction, what do we think? Shorten. But not necessarily does a muscle shorten, even though it's working or contracting. For example, I had to contract muscles to go over to, the, to this point. Now, I'm going to do this. I'm going to push the wall. Am I going to push the wall? No. Yeah, no. How come? Well, it's not immovable. Somebody could push the wall. Superman could come and push the wall. <laughs> but I, there's no way this wall's going anywhere because I can't do what? I can't create enough what? Tension to push this load. But did, did I not do anything? If you try to push a wall for a period of time and then you let go, your muscles are going to hurt. How come? Because they're doing work. They're trying to do all of the chemistry we discussed, but the muscles aren't able to do what? So muscles lengthening are, is also muscles working. They don't necessarily have to just get short to work. They can also stretch to work. And we talked about that with different muscle movements. When I go to pick this up, there's a bunch of different muscles working. Muscles here and muscles here. Are these shortening? No, I wouldn't be able to lift squat if that happened. Because these have to shorten and these have to lengthen. So the next part of the book talks about different types of contraction. So you need to understand the difference between isotonic and isometric. In order for me to tone, and this is how I remember it, so I'm hoping it'll help you remember it. In order for me to tone up my muscles, what do I do? I go to, I go where? I go to the gym and I do what? I lift weights. I lift weights. I pick a something up and I move it from one place to another by doing what? Shortening the muscles. So isotonic contraction actually causes the muscles to shorten so I can get toned. Isometric contraction still does work, but it doesn't do what? Shorten a muscle and typically doesn't do what? Typically. Well, in that case, it didn't. No, it tones. Let's not talk tone, though. Let's talk load. Is it going to move a load? Not typically. So know the difference between isotonic and isometric. We see in this case isotonic contraction. Remember, muscles shorten and then they pull on what? What just happened? A muscle shortened, it pulled on what? Some sort of stable, straight thing. The tendon pulls on a bone and moves a load. Yes? I'm going to talk um, physics terms 
in the beginning of chapter 10. We're going to talk about levers and fulcrums and pulleys. I know, you believe that nonsense? It's in anatomy, too. So, the tendon pulls on a load, pulls on your bone to move a load. That is a what kind of traction? A contraction. Isotonic. So when we look at an isotonic contraction and we look at the tension that develops, again, we're moving a load. There's usually a peak tension. The highest or largest load my muscle group can uh, lift. And then when it goes back down to rest, we see that that tension decreases. When we have an isometric contraction, the muscle itself can exceed the what? The, the tension cannot exceed the what? The load. So the muscle might not necessarily shorten. But is the muscle doing work? Yes. Absolutely. And you try to go push the wall. You can do push-ups up against. You don't have to go to a gym to, to work your muscles to create this chemistry going on. You can just take your own weight and move it, right? You can do push-ups up against the wall and work your muscles. You move a load. You can just hold that muscle out straight for long periods of time. You try doing this. Hold your arm out like this. Yeah. Do you feel it? You're not moving anything, are you? Is there something happening? Yeah. So isometric contraction, you have resistance, but what happens to the length of the muscle? It stays long and doesn't shorten. Okay? So that's what they talk about when they talk about concentric contraction and eccentric contraction. So with eccentric, we're going to generate force and lengthen. Concentric is going to do what? Generate force, but shorten. Now, in order for muscles to do their work, they need energy. Also, before I get too far, um, it talks a little bit about muscle tone. You can tone muscles increase fiber amount, keep them good and strong and nice and elastic by working them. Just like neurons, if you don't use them, you what? You lose them. They start to decrease in myofibril number and kind of wither away. So you constantly want to make sure you work them. Anybody ever break a bone or be out of commission, say, you know, you have your arm in a cast for long periods of time, and then you get the cast off, and it's like, holy moly, I'm a weakling, right? What do you have to do? You have to increase stimulation to those muscles to increase muscle tone. So that is important to keep muscle tone up. So energy, that's what the book talks about next. There's three different ways for me to make energy for my muscles to do their work. Remember, what is that energy molecule I'm interested in making in order for muscles to do their work? It's ATP. So there's three different ways that muscles get their ATP. Now, the most efficient way, the most ATP I can get is going to be ATP that I make with the help of an oxygen molecule. That type of ATP lasts a whole long time. And I'm kind of working my way backwards here. That type of ATP works a whole long time, makes a whole lot of it, and lasts for quite a long period of time, hours. When I have oxygen on board, that is called what? What kind of ATP production? Aerobic. And the reaction to make ATP is called cellular respiration. So when I have oxygen and I make my ATP, it's called aerobic respiration. And everybody goes, respiration, doesn't have, isn't that like breathing? What the heck is she talking about? 
Well, why do you breathe? <laughs> exactly, to get oxygen and get rid of carbon dioxide. So we see the two terms kind of work hand in hand. So when we talk about aerobic respiration, we talk about oxygen, we talk about lots of ATP that lasts hours for us. But we can also make smaller amounts of ATP without oxygen. And as a matter of fact, most prokaryotic organisms use anaerobic respiration. And what's that? Making ATP without oxygen to make their ATP. But prokaryotic cells are they're kind of dinky, aren't they? Are they very complex? Not really. They don't need as much energy, exactly. So when we talk about eukaryotic cells, more complex, much larger, we have cells that can undergo aerobic respiration, make lots of ATP. Next semester, when we discuss cellular respiration, we're going to see that it involves a bunch of different pathways, both anaerobic and aerobic. So the beginning part of the whole big giant reaction we're going to discuss next semester is called glycolysis. And this is where I take glucose and I start to break it down in a series of chemical reactions. We can see here under the middle section that glycolysis is an anaerobic form of cellular respiration. And it's going to make small amounts of ATP. Do they last as long? No. And one other bad thing about trying to rely on anaerobic respiration too much is we see lots of waste product being produced by glycolysis when we try to do that too much. It's something called lactic acid. Remember those cramps I was telling you about? Anybody long distance runner? run for long periods of time? Do you ever get cramps? Yeah. Oh, yeah, like burning? Like burning. Yeah. Like and what is that? Exactly. It's a buildup of lactic acid because you're using up oxygen at too fast a rate. And your cells need to get their ATP and need to move. So what you're doing is undergoing anaerobic respiration at a higher rate than normal. Your body normally can take care of the waste products associated with anaerobic respiration very easy. But when you do it at too fast a rate, it can't take care of those waste products as easily. So that's anaerobic. There's another anaerobic type of ATP formation. And that's the first one on the, all the way over there on the left. It's called direct phosphorylation. And this is when I take, with the help of enzymes, and grab excess phosphates and tack them right back on to ATPs that I just broke apart. ATPs that I just broke apart are called ADPs and phosphate. We saw that when we talked about the hydrolysis of ATP during the muscle contraction sliding filament theory. Remember that? So I can quick tack on phosphates back with the help of an enzyme called what? Creatine. And creatine with a P on it is creatine phosphate, yes? It can donate its phosphates to who? ADP to make ATP. Anybody do lifting or weight stuff in this class? You ever hear of a supplement called what? Creatine, what's it supposedly supposed to do for you? Make me stronger, why? Give you more available ATP, but guess what? How long does it last? How much does that stuff cost? A lot of money, yeah? Don't waste your money. Yeah, no. This? which is free, cheaper, better. What? Just breathe. Exactly. So you get more ATP production when you learn during your exercise routine to do what? Breathe. When you get really tired, 
kind of in the afternoon and you go to the cafeteria and you get yeah you know what I mean right gotta get a coffee I'm so tired you know what it's gonna help you feel better two things get a water hydrate yourself and what's the second thing breathe not just what you tend to do when you're tired breathe like really breathe fill up your lungs as much as you can and breathe out do that ten times whoo and it's free yes yeah the coffee really doesn't work so well caffeine peps you up a little bit but then boom you get that dive you're much better off to take a few minutes to do some deep breathing anybody meditate or do any little relaxation techniques the best gift you can give yourself is to learn to do that it's free yes and just to bring take yourself away for 10 minutes you have 10 minutes you do to breathe close your eyes breathe not go to sleep and take a nap on the couch but breathe you'll be able to make more, your energy more efficiently so you need to know the three different ways that your muscle is going to get its ATP you need to know the difference between anaerobic and aerobic production of ATP and which one's the most efficient who's gonna make the most and which one's gonna last the longest this guy yes and those we can see these guys on page 299 in your textbook so energy for exercise prolonged duration of exercise what what do we call that exercise when we when we get on the treadmill and we <laughs> what's that called cardiac. well cardiac is what aerobic exercise why do we call it that you're causing the respiratory rate to go up your muscles to contract more you're getting more what in for this type of respiration aerobic respiration okay so we see comparison of energy sources depending on what we need to do it's okay if what we're doing is going to happen really really fast to use the really really fast forms of energy right if I'm sprinting for six seconds I'm good but if I need to do things for longer periods of time I need to have that efficient oxygen the stuff that uh, oxygen ATP with the help of oxygen that's going to last for longer periods of time so we see different energy sources being utilized during different activities um, ATP that's stored up in muscles for those quick bursts ATP that's formed by creatine phosphate and ADP if we go a little bit longer if we have to start breaking some molecules down for cellular respiration in the 30 to 40 second range we're going to go and use some of our stored up glucose what's that stuff called glycogen and we store that not only in the liver which is a big huge source of glycogen but we also store it in our muscle cells as well but who's going to give us the long duration the long haul that anaerobically excuse me aerobically produced ATP and that's going to last us for much longer periods of time so the next thing in the book and again a little bit more repetitive stuff in this chapter is going to talk about force of muscle contraction by the way um, when I wear out my energy source my muscles can no longer do the work that they need and fatigue is discussed in your textbook as well and again that's when I run out of that energy source and we're going to have waste products build up we're going to have cramps we're going to have um, muscle contractions that can't let go and muscle fatigue that will occur as well don't forget um, muscles also produce what as a waste product well lactic acid is a waste product of what 
what kind of respiration? Anaerobic, Anaerobic respiration, glycolysis. Excess muscle contraction can lead to excess anaerobic production of energy, which can lead to lactic acid buildup. Heat. Muscles also produce heat as a waste product. So heat production during activity is also discussed in our book as well. After you exercise, you still need to produce a lot of ATP to get those muscle cells back into their resting state. So oxygen consumption after exercise is still going to be what? It's still going to be increased. So even after you exercise and your breathing rate gets back to normal and your heart rate gets back to normal, you're still using more oxygen than normal to make more ATP than normal. So your metabolic rate, the rate in which your reactions take place, is what? Higher. You've, you've heard that stuff before, metabolic rate, right? The rate of metabolism. Metabolism takes energy. If I want to burn off a certain amount of energy, what's two ways to do it? We're just talking a lot about one of them right now. Yeah, exercise is going to burn off energy, and what else? We haven't talked about this one yet. We'll talk about it next semester. I'm getting hand signals from the back of the room. He said, eating. Why is eating increased metabolic rate? Yeah, I have to digest it. I have to use energy to break it down, to bring it in, to get it small, to bring around to the cells. So those are two ways to increase metabolic rate. So if I want to use excess energy up, what are the two ways I need to do that? And excess energy I'm talking about in the form of what? That we store away for a rainy day. Lipids. If I want to use those excess lipids, what do I need to do? Eat and exercise. Yes? The two need to go hand in hand. So when you try to get rid of excess stored energy, it sounds so much better than fat, doesn't it? You need to do those two things. What's going to happen if you don't get enough of the molecules you need to produce the energy you need. What's going to happen to your metabolic rate? It's going to slow way down. It's a protection mechanism. So for those of you who tried to get rid of excess energy by starving yourselves to death, no. Counterproductive. Yes? So you can go to Subway and have a sandwich. It's not really that fresh, though. Yeah, high fructose corn syrup in their bread. Very bad, very bad. We're getting the inside scoop. It's very bad for you because it's a very highly concentrated form of glucose and it raises your insulin levels very high, very fast. Artificial High fructose, here's two things that when you read the food label, and you'll learn this in my nutrition class when you take nutrition class. If you read these two things on your food label, put it back on the shelf and run away. One is high fructose corn syrup. What's the other one? Hydrogenated anything. Yes? Put it back, walk away. Very bad. Again, we'll talk about that next semester. No, no. Mess up your tongues too. But it tricks your brain into thinking that you've actually you've got more sugar than you need, and then you actually end up eating more sugar than you need because your body crashes literally. So it causes you to it causes you to crave more sweet right. to satisfy your receptors. 
just use good old sugar and use less of it. <laughs> Well, that's a whole nother argument and so. But that's another <laughs> argument. Just use the regular, better, better to sweeten your stuff is natural honey. Um, maple, maple, you know, natural maple syrup. The less processed item is, the better off it is. Huh? The real key Yeah, exactly. And 16 calories in a, in, in a teaspoon of sugar. Is that really gonna, you know, make you gain 750 pounds? No, not really. You're good. All right. So we we got sidetracked. Sorry. Force of muscle contraction. Again, we talk a little bit about recruitment. How many muscle fibers? We're repeating ourselves again in a different way in this chapter. Again, one of the chapters that kind of drives me crazy, but. We're talking about contractile force. The larger the number of fibers I can stimulate, the more force I can create. And that's basically what that diagram is talking about. The force is created by the shortening of the sarcomeres. So we look at a comparison here in this diagram of the sarcomeres at rest versus during contraction. So when is the optimal shortening taking place of the sarcomeres in any given myofibro when they're about 75 percent shortened muscle wise and that kind of doesn't make sense but don't worry about it um, Again, repeat information. Factors that influence the velocity and duration of skeletal muscle are listed under velocity and duration of contraction, page 302 and 303 in your textbook. Again, um, different fibers can utilize energy and shorten and lengthen at different rates. So we talk about the speed of contraction and we talk about slow fibers versus fast fibers. Again, when I have to do something very quickly, different muscle groups or different muscle fibers will kick into action for short periods of time. And we will see different movements depending on how they use the ATP that was created. You'll also see terms here like oxidative fibers, slow oxidative fibers. Now those guys, you don't even have to look in the book. Think about oxygen, production of ATP. What do you think the slow oxidative fiber can do? Yeah, contract for longer periods of time than a fast oxidative fiber, which still uses the ATP that was produced by oxidative phosphorylation or aerobic respiration but can only do it for shorter periods of time, in bursts. And how about the fast glycolytic fiber? That's the using the ATP from that quick stuff and can only do it for what? Yeah, a few seconds, very short periods of time. So we see combinations of all of these guys in any given muscle group. So. Contract slowly because of myosin, ATPase. Our ATPases are slow. We see it, a list, a list of a whole bunch of different things here. Um, don't worry about that too, too much. Just understand that any given muscle is a combination of different types of fibers and can perform different functions using those different types of fibers. So fast oxidative, slow oxidative, fast glycolytic in this particular muscle group here. Different stains will pick up different characteristics and we can actually see them under the microscope. Um, table 9.2 on page 303 um, describes these different fibers and shows us some of the, different, the differences in them. You don't have to memorize that chart, but I just want to point out that it's there for you as well. 
Um, this diagram here, greater the load, the less the muscle shortens, and the shorter the duration of contraction. So if I have a very, very heavy load, even though the muscle is shorter and the duration is shorter, there's still work being done versus a light load. I can do a light load for what? Yeah, longer periods of time. And I can have a much more what? What happened to this muscle? What's this muscle, by the way, which we're going to learn next? Biceps, yes? When I have a lighter load, I can do what? Look at the graph. Relate what I'm doing here to that graph. I can shorten the muscle much, much more for what? Longer periods of time. Heavy load. It doesn't shorten as much, and it, I can't do it as long. So when I go to the gym, if I increase my weights, can I lift them 15 times and do it really quick? No. What do I have to do? when you start increasing your weights on your weight machine, what do you do? Less. Yes? You can't lift it 12 times anymore because what's going to happen to your muscle? It's going to give me a science term. Kids with an F. Fatigue. Exactly. So that's what this is showing us. Adaptation to exercise. The more I do this, the more I stimulate those muscle fibers, the better I'm going to get at moving loads. The more myofibrils I create inside muscle cells. So they talk a little bit about um, what happens during exercise. So aerobic exercise, when I use lots of oxygen, endurance exercises, swimming, jogging, fast walking, biking, using a lot of skeletal muscle groups and a lot of oxygen. What happens to our muscles as we continue to do this? No, well, they get stronger. They get more myofibrils. They're also going to increase the number of mitochondria inside the cells. There's going to be physiological changes inside your cells. It's not going to happen right away. So if you've been a couch potato all your life, and then you decide to join the gym, you're not going to do 25 minutes on the elliptical. You'll die. Yes? What are you going to do? Five. And that's good for today. And then tomorrow, you're going to do what? Six. <laughs> Four, because you're sore. <laughs> I like that one. And then the next day, you're going to do seven. And the next day, you're going to do eight. You see what I mean? What I mean? Because you have to allow for these physiological changes to happen. Again, on page 304, right under aerobic endurance exercise, we see what happens. We get more capillaries that will start branching off to supply more blood to those muscle cells that are being worked more. More blood means more what? more oxygen. More oxygen means I can make more energy. We also see the number of mitochondria within the muscle fibers increase. Why more mitochondria? What do mitochondria do? This is where I'm going to make most of my ATP what? Aerobically. Very good. So we get more mitochondria. We see more being produced. We also get more myofibrils. We also get more of a pigment called myoglobin. What's myoglobin? Huh? Yeah, yeah, it actually physically makes the muscle red. But what's it for, do you know? What, what do I need to make a lot of energy? Oxygen. It corrects. Myoglobin is very similar to hemoglobin. So it's going to help, yeah, so it's going to help carry oxygen or hold on to oxygen so that ATP production can increase as well. Resistance exercises are going to help stimulate different muscle groups, some of those smaller muscle groups. 
So when we decide to exercise, we should have a balanced exercise program. So not only the aerobic, but what else? Anaerobic or you still use oxygen to do it. That weight-bearing exercise. Okay, so it should be a combination of both in a balanced exercise program, which they talk about on page 305. Now that, all that discussion that we had was talking about skeletal muscle, striated skeletal muscle or striated what? What's another striated muscle besides skeletal muscle? Cardiac muscle. But that's the, not the only kind of muscle that we have. We also have smooth muscle. When I look at it under the microscope, do I see those striations? No, because what happens with these guys, we have those regulatory proteins and all of the little sarcomeres, but they don't line up like that. They line up in a different way so we don't see stripes. I'm gonna show you that in a minute. And they tend to lay, I, when I look at them under the microscope, it reminds me of a whole bunch of worms kind of sitting on top of each other. And we see them in different directions when we talk about um, the way they work inside organ systems. So usually where we see smooth muscle, smooth muscle is involuntary. We see it in our visceral organs. It's still going to shorten and lengthen and move things. And we usually see it associated with tubes, like the digestive system, when we talk about the digestive system, when we talk about the circulatory system, when we talk about arteries and veins. We're going to talk more about smooth muscle and its function in basically squeezing on tubes and moving things from one place to another. So we see here a longitudinal layer of smooth muscle and a circular layer of smooth muscle in places, tubes, like the small intestine. So when we talk about systems, they're a combination of different tissues that make up organs that make up systems. Remember we talked about that first chapter? You with me? So this is an up close and personal look at the fibers that we've been talking about, those myofibrils, and their arrangement in a smooth muscle cell. Do you ever go to the store and get a bag of onions or a bag of potatoes that have that weird kind of mesh looking thing? Well now when you go to the store you're going to look at them differently. What I want you to do, and try to make sure that the produce guy isn't watching you, because he's going to think you're strange. I want you to go over and I want you to pull on, pull on one little weld associated with some of the plastic on those bags. When you pull on one little weld, what's going to happen? It's going to, it's going to pull on all the other little pieces of plastic that are in that configuration. You have to do it to understand what I'm talking about. So next time you go to the grocery store, go, go to the onion bags. Or if you have one at home, that's even better. You don't have to embarrass yourself, right? But doesn't it look like that? OK. There's little, little spot welds that hold those myofibril arrangements together. They're called dense bodies. And when I start to create that change, within a smooth muscle cell, we're going to see it start to pull on these little dense bodies. When I start to pull on one, it's going to cause a chain reaction and pull on all the other ones, just like in your onion bag. And what's going to happen to the cell? Just like in the skeletal muscle with all those myofibrils going like this, pulling on those little dense bodies is going to shorten the cell as well. So we see a relaxed smooth muscle fiber versus a contracted smooth muscle fiber. And we have some different proteins associated with it. Those dense bodies are extremely important because they're going to cause the change in configuration. So when we talk about smooth muscle, we don't see a troponin complex in the thin filaments. Who's going to be responsible for that change or that pull? 
It's going to be the what? The dense body. So we see intermediate filament dense body networks that are going to cause the whole shebang to shorten. Unlike we saw with the sarcomeres, tropin and tropomyosin complex in the skeletal muscle cell. Okay? There's a little bit different a um, chain reaction of events. And this is um, described on page 308, figure 9.28. And what's going to happen is we're going to change some of the different proteins within the cell that will cause the myosin-actin interaction. Those proteins are called protein kinases. And with the help of calcium, again, still the, still the guy who's going to initiate the change in smooth muscle, we're going to see those protein kinases come into play to help the change in myosin-actin interaction. So we're going to activate inactive protein kinases with the help of calcium and a, and a um, molecule called calmodulin. So we don't have tropin and tropomyosin, we have calmodulin and calcium that are going to cause inactive kinases to become active kinases, and that's going to cause the reaction with who and who? Actin and myosin. Very good. So these are some of the differences in smooth muscle versus skeletal muscle. Um, don't worry about that. <laughs> don't forget your interactive physiology. Don't forget <laughs> your interactive physiology. Seriously, it's going to make so much more sense if you use that program. You watch it five, six, seven times, and all of a sudden it's going to do what? It's going to click. Okay? So you want to start Chapter 10? No. All right, I'll give you a break. Also, I'll give you a break. Here's my gift, your, my Thanksgiving gift to you. I'm going to open the quiz for Chapter 9, and it's not due until next Tuesday before class. No. Don't get greedy. All right, there's a sign-in sheet going around. Where is that piece of paper? Hand it to the lovely lady beside you. Don't forget your interactive physiology and have a wonderful Thanksgiving break.